Hello, I'm Ali and in this latest video instalment of Back to the Archives, we delve into playful approaches to education and learning through games from our PlayArc event back in 2013. This event explored the theme of Reclaimed, shedding light on innovative approaches to learning, living and working through the transformative lens of games and play. Nick Fortugno is a game designer and entrepreneur of digital and real world games based in New York and a founder of Playmatics, a game development company, and is also a co-founder of the Come Out and Play Street Games Festival in New York City. Nick talks about learning as experimentation, and that means both as failure and as play. Games figure into this very well because games create environments where experimentation is encouraged, where failure is low cost and motivating, and where challenges can be adapted to the exact skill level of the user. Nick joined the festival talks via live video link from New York, so the quality of the sound isn't the best, so please switch on the closed captions. We hope you enjoyed the video. Do let us know your thoughts in the comments and give us a like. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date. Hi everybody. Hello. Hello. Okay, so it's, a, it's an interesting position to be speaking to people when I can't see them, um, but <laughs> I will make this work. Um, so I would ask today to speak a bit more about some of my games on work, particularly around um, education, um, because I felt because that was felt to be a topic that that, that, that people were interested in and that, that uh, wasn't as represented on others. I know there's a lot of education I've heard. And so really what I want to do is be a bit visionary about what games can do. Because I think that, you know, having worked in education and games for a long time, you know, my background is really um, doing innovative game design. That's where Come Out and Play came from. Um, I did a lot of work with, uh, you know, sort of educational partners, political partners, um, and game companies trying to explore new kinds of mechanics. And Come Out and Play was a part out of that spirit of like, hey, where else can we make games and what can we make games about? Um, I've actually gotten to see education and games change kind of dramatically over time. And this actually doesn't take the form that people, I think, think it takes in educational circles. Um, there was an old belief about education that it was really anti-game, um, particularly around like the rise of Pokemon and you know, fear that students' were, brains were being eaten alive and space that could be taken by the periodic tables was in fact being in, like, recognizing who like, Charizard is. Um, wow, so be back there. Um, so, what I want to do is sort of give an analysis of where I think games are in education today and talk a little bit about a vision that they have, which is kind of radical, but I actually don't think too far off. So, to start with, um, I want to think a bit about where education is today, or a vision for how education can work. Um, so what I want you to do is start by imagining a game. Let's say that we took um, a game that people could play and change it a bit to kind of give it a different structure. Um, so we can start by assuming, I'm going to use a Super Meat Boy for this example, which is an important indie game um, that focuses on like super hard gameplay. It's a good example. But please don't think anything I say about Super Meat Boy here to be true. This is hypothetical. I want you to imagine a game where, when you entered the game, you saw a challenge for the first time, that you were given really no preparation for it at all. Um, and when you tried it, it was difficult, so you likely failed. But when you failed, you were punished for it, in a permanent way. So like your score went down permanently because you failed at it. Um, but you only get a single try through the game. You don't ever really get to try it again. And while you could earn points late on, uh, the scores you got were going to hold with you forever. So in that early experimentation when you failed, you hurt yourself, even though it was inevitable that you would fail. And so you only get a single try at everything. And perhaps most importantly, if you don't get a certain score, you have the whole, like the whole game 
again from the beginning before you can play any other game. There is no game that works that way, but that's how school works. And it, it isn't. Actually, is a game. I mean, when you when you think about it from all the context of what a game does, you actually come up with a pretty interesting set of co conditions. It's based on a set of challenges. The challenges are tied to a skill level. You're asked to push yourself to succeed. You're evaluated and scored based on your success. The score is tied to a meta system. Like all of the things that we think about in terms of the ways games operate are actually true for tests as well. Um, the difference is that tests suck. Um, they don't give you any interesting feedback. They set failure bars way too high. They're not fun at all. Um, and they ignore the lessons that games have taught us about teaching, which is, I think, really the interesting flip side of all of this, which is that when we think about the history of games, um, what we realize is that games themselves have always been educational. This is Jim G's argument. Um, what we find is that games have been constantly engaged in a, an exercise of teaching. And the main reason why is that for commercial reasons, games had to teach. Um, if you think about games in their earliest days in the arcade, you know, when someone walked up to the machine, no one was going to play through a tutorial, especially if you put a quarter into that thing. So the game had to figure out how to instruct itself relatively quickly. And that theme has kind of continued itself through the process of, of game design. You know, as games have become more accessible to people, as games become available on new platforms, and certainly street games, where everyone's standing around thinking of something else they could be doing besides playing your game. Um, if you take too long explaining your game, everybody burns out. So we get very good as street game designers at evaluating the idea of how games work and then condensing that to a really simple form and giving people ways to experiment with them that will be successful and eventually become good at them because a lot of times with more sophisticated street games, skill is actually necessary to enjoy the game. So finding an on-ramp where people can actually explore the game in an interesting way um, but fail safely is really critical. And so while I would never argue that games have a better model of education than education, because I, I never try to question things that have had literally billions of dollars spent in research on them without at least taking what they say slightly seriously, I think that games are a, are a sort of original condition from a blank slate where we've been able to analyze all these things about education um, through purely commercial necessities, and I think it's led us to some interesting places. And that's fascinating to me, because what it tells me is that there's a, a pretty huge way that schools have been unsuccessful at imparting education. And this is, and what's really amazing to me is this is generally recognized in the educational community. So I'm actually very much involved, and my company's very much involved in games for educational purposes. And I've been, I, you know, I have a set of white papers that are coming out from a, something called the Cooney Center, which is tied to. Sesame Workshop with an educational um, researcher named Eric Tucker um, that, that, that were commissioned really around this very topic. And so this all came out of think tanks that are organized around this, and there are conferences in all parts of the world really analyzing the way games can be used. And I think it's because educators realize this too. And in the conversations I have, we're way outside of this realm of like games rotting kids' brains. There's a, a straightforward understanding that games have a ton to offer education. So this is a two-way conversation. Um, and, and I think it's, what's fascinating about that is that I really do think in, in a unique way games have a lot to offer education. And in a unique way I think educators are welcoming that idea. Games won't do that in the form that they are, but they'll do that in some form. And I think that there's an imagining of the future in which games infiltrate all aspects of education. Now I, I feel like that's a bold statement to make, and I, and I mean it. I, I'm going to say it as bluntly as I can. I think education in the next 10 to 15 years is going to be completely gamified. I think every way that we understand education is going to be changed around an idea of what game logic brings to an educational system. Um, but I want to parse that a bit because I think that, that, that it sounds a bit radical, but when you actually start thinking about the places where this could happen, and you realize that what I'm talking about here is not literally bringing Minecraft and Civ 2 into a classroom so that people play those games, but instead revising the whole educational system around games as a way of understanding what an informational model can be for kids, then there's a logic to this that starts to, I think, make sense. So let's start with, I think, the basic things that games are half bringing to education right now and could bring in a much more deep way. Um, really, when we think about grades in general 
and we think about the way students are evaluated. That's the primary place where education is accessing games right now. And if you go to a conference or you go to talks around games and education, this is the topic you're going to hear about. You're going to see a lot of things that look like this. Um, this is a graph um, that's tied to a school in New York called the School of One. And it's designed to atomize students' educational, students educational logic um, and, and progress such that they can be evaluated based on every skill. So what you're looking at here is a set of exercises that students have been involved with. And you can see like there's little boxes in the grid that tie to different student numbers which have been blanked out um, that are green and yellow and red. Um, and you can see that there's assessments that can be made from these things. So for example, um, the, the second bar, um, most students are taking more lesson exposures than expected on the skill is an evaluation of how students have been looking at that skill over time and the ways in which they've been kind of falling behind. So the yellows and reds here indicate class sessions in which students at the end in an assessment that happens at the end of every class have not succeeded. Whereas the, the first bar shows one where students are mastering the skill at the appropriate pace, but there's one child who's fallen behind. This model of constant evaluation and constant assessment is something that games can provide for us because I think there's a really interesting place where we can say that um, what games do, if we think about them just as information systems, is games constantly challenge us and then constantly give us access to the results of that challenge through feedback. And so there's a regular loop that happens in games where I do something challenging, I see my results, my results are measured against the goals I'm trying to pursue, and then I'm given feedback about how well I did. That's something that schools immediately see as useful. It's, a, it's an imagining that breaks the idea of a barrier test down to a, to a continuous set of testing so that we can have a constant sense of presence with the student. And if that's the case, then we can model the behavior of the student to their educational package such that they get an individuated education system. And that's something that's really fascinating for people. You know, the idea that we could track everything a player does and use that information to both forward a player's motivation and provide a detailed picture of how the player played the game has immediate ramifications on education. Um, and this is where the conversation starts and stops for educators, really. Like, when you talk to most educators about this, this is where they are right now. And, and the screen I'm showing you right now, I think, is kind of an, an interesting emblematic screen for what I think educators want, is this idea that we could track everything a student achieves, we could track how long it took them to achieve it, we could track how well they, they made the achievement, and then we could individually tailor the experience to them. Nick, can you show us that graph? Because we can't see it. Oh, okay. Please. I'll, I'll go back. <laughs> right, so this, this chart, um, oh, sorry, uh, I know what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, sorry, that's me being really loud and laughing in the mic. <laughs> yeah, no worries, we, you know, we're experimenting here. Um, <laughs> So, got to skip ahead to it because I seem to have reset my slides. So this kind of chart of achievements, um, I think is exactly where education wants to go, right? In terms of like really marking every single thing you've done and providing feedback for every single thing you've done and providing ranks, you know, that, that the, the dream of this chart um, you know, which is which in information design is crude because these are lessons that educators I think are still learning. Um, you know, would eventually kind of evolve into a, a live arcade kind of system where every student was tracked on a live arcade system. Um, and it, and like I said, if you go to educational conferences, this is what you're going to hear about. If you if you go to these sort of think tank groups that are at the cutting edge of what games can do, this is the conversation you're going to have. I think the technology provides for this. And I think games have provided a really compelling system to do this. But what I don't want is for this to become the, the kind of be-all and end-all of, of what games are. And actually, the reason why I, I, I'm interested in giving talks like this to game designers is because you're going to start engaging with educators on this topic. I, I really can't tell you exactly how big this is going to get, at least in the United States. There are millions of dollars being pushed towards this exercise, um, largely because education has been a kind of a train wreck. And there's ways the needle has simply not moved. 
Um, there's a great statistic I heard. This is an aside, but just to give you a sense of the scope of this problem. Um, if you look at literacy rates in the United States and you ask yourself how many schools have evolved literacy rates uh, above two grade levels for the students who enter the class, meaning that students come into the class and then they are taught by that class and when they get out of the class they're two grade levels higher in literacy than when they came in. Um, the number is in the single digits of all of the schools in the United States. That's in, an enormous failing that education recognizes because they just don't, we haven't figured out yet how to teach this stuff in a way that really moves the bar and literacy is you know, one of the sc big scary things that gets left behind, especially in inner city schools. So th there's a desperation around this and if games can fulfill this point, they're going to kind of push the games as hard as they can. And like I said, since education and games are already so close, I feel like there's a natural way this is going to happen where more and more game designers are going to be brought into the process. And there's been early successes with things like School of One and Quest to Learn and a few other enterprises in, in major cities. But what I'm concerned about is that a lot of educators see this purely as an assessment play. They, they really do see it as like a way of tracking students better and then tailoring information for them better. And I think that misses some of the bars that we can bring to it. So there are other ways that I think education is equally important in, in, in the, uh, the games are equally important in the way that it can be related to education. And so the, I want to talk a little bit more about those as well. Like what else do games bring to the table? So. The other thing that games bring that I think comes part and parcel with this information play is the idea of replayability um, and the forgiveness of failure. Games don't expect you to be good at them the first time you try. Games' whole educational model is based on the idea that you will fail. But what I think is interesting about game failure is that it's never harshly penalized. We may make fun of you because you failed, uh, we, may, we may insult you a little bit because you failed, we may pick on you, but we never discourage you from coming back. We always push you to come back. And in fact, game screens that give game over messages always encourage you to try again. That that's actually the nature of the experience. So one of the things that I think games can offer if we take seriously this idea of continual assessment is the fact that the stakes of any individual assessment can drop. We can allow students to just experiment for a while, you know, which is what we do with games. You know, the first time you pick up a tennis racket, the first time you play chess, the first time you open your browser in League of Legends, you don't know what you're going to do and you don't know how you're going to do. And in fact, we have phrasing in games that's cultural around the idea of learning games. Though this is a learning game. You know, the first time you play something, you don't expect to win. And I think that, that, that that's a mind shift that's going to be absolutely necessary to education that games have kind of mastered. Uh, and I think particularly if we look at very hard games right now, we can see a vehicle where this can work. Um, tied to this is an idea that, the, that, that games individuate themselves already for individual players. Um, so I'm looking at a screenshot of Mario Kart here. And I think what... What is always fascinating about Mario Kart is you can see in the distance there's a glowing blue package. Um, that's a power-up that a player can get in Mario Kart. But what's fascinating to me about the way Mario Kart works is that package has not been predetermined by the system to contain anything. It's really an empty box. And what happens is when a player collides with the box, they generate a power-up based on their position in the race. So a, a character that's very hard ahead, far ahead gets a fairly weak power-up that's not very useful. But a character that's very far behind can get an extremely powerful power-up um, that can cause them to immediately accelerate, be immune to damage, and race forward. And what's interesting is that that's actually gr granulated to specifically the position you are in the race. So a second-ranked player in a race will get a different power-up than a third-ranked player 
um, specific to the needs that they have. Second and third rank players get things that attack the main player rather than power-ups that speed them up because that's their immediate interest. What this does is it creates an effect in the race, um, which is typically known in racing games as rubber banding, where the racers stay closer together because this makes for a more interesting game. It's less interesting when one player just dominates the whole time and everybody else just lags behind. But that, that point, um, the idea that you would modulate the difficulty for a system, for individual people in the system, which is typically called dynamic difficulty adjustment, you can parse that pretty easily, right? Like, it adjusts the difficulty dynamically based on the player's performance. Um, offers this huge opportunity to tailor experiences specifically for individual users. And if that logic were applied to education in a more broad way, um, I think that, that you can really transform the relationship between an individual student and education. Um, this is already done to some extent. There's certain kinds of automatic tests in the US. The GRE does this already where when you answer one question based on how well you answered it, you're pushed to a harder question or down to a lower question. But again, that's a sort of like one, one stop, you pass or fail this thing, and good luck. Um, I think this is something that could be applied in a more broad way to all of education. If we imagine that every homework assignment you got was DDA enabled, so that the homework assignment was transforming itself as you did it to compensate for your level of skill. That ties the evaluation step really interestingly, and it leads to a really interesting ramification, which I think is the most radical thing we could talk about um, in regards to education and the transformation schemes to bring to education, which is the end of grades. Um, a grade in education is an assembly line model version of education that assumes that every student of a certain age can perform the same way, and it provides an easy way to push them all through the system. But this creates enormous problems in education on both sides. On the high end, the problem is that if you accelerate beyond the education level of the class, you have nowhere to go. You're just kind of stuck using boring materials, and people who were good at school usually have this experience of becoming bored by school. If you're below that experience, in terms of you just moving slower than your grade level, then the tasks quickly surpass you and you become frustrated. And in that frustration, you basically bow out of the system. Those words, though, are really interesting, right? Bored and frustrated, um, which are words you hear in the educational circles. These are exactly the same words that Shikset Mahaili uses in in the book Flow to describe how we produce happiness. That we're happiest when a task that we're presented with is just within our challenge range. That it matches our skill closely. That's what gives us a sense of flow and it correlates highly with happiness. So, so and, that, and game designers use that all the time. If a level is too hard, people get frustrated. If a level is too easy, people get bored. We want to be in that flow state. We want to be in the middle. So there's a really interesting ramification of this when you start thinking about it, which is that if we can informationally design um, assignments with dynamic difficulty adjustment, and we can provide students with direct feedback that's game-like feedback, you know, this is literally gamifying education at the, at the most basic level, then we can allow students to accelerate at their own pace, which is what they do in games anyway. Um, nobody forces you to stay behind in a, in a game of League of Legends or a game of, you know, a multiplayer Call of Duty. You rise to the level of your skill. When you're good enough to fight the big dogs, you move into the room with the big dogs. And you can do that if you're 8, or you can do that if you're 13, or you can do that if you're 30. Like, nobody in a game cares. It's just about your aptitude. That's something that education can have with the currently existing technology. It's a lot of assignment building, but we could do that right now. But if we do that, there's a radical transformation into the way we understand how classrooms work because we have to just then assume that the quick students are going to race ahead and the slow students are going to take their time and that idea that we're all pushed into one grade is going to start to collapse. The whole structure of education could be transformed around an informational model where everybody's just leveling up. And if it takes you longer to level up, that's no big deal. You just spend a little bit more time killing rats in the woods. And if you're racing, get to the high you know, the high monster areas, get to the high level monsters. You know, start, start getting into PvP earlier. You know, you just move at your own pace through the system. But the system can know where you are and increase the challenges for you. 
So while there is a, a kind of more important purpose to education in terms of the reason why you're playing in the first place, we can use all of those tools to make sure we know where you are and how you move. And I think that leads to the most interesting ramification of all of this, the, the one that I actually feel the most compelled about and the reason why this is such a big deal to me. Um, it means that education would be fun, like literally fun. You know, we could get back to a place where, where education actually is challenging in an interesting way. And if it were challenging in an interesting way, I think we'd find that fun. Um, I say that for a couple reasons. The first is that we know that's how games work. Right? The, we, when we look at the Brian Sutton Smith analysis of golf, or we look at you know, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman's work in Rules of Play, or we think about Jesper Yule's work in The Art of Failure, it's been analyzed over and over and over again that, that at the heart of games is this idea that an interesting challenge is what motivates us, and that we find that interesting challenge fun when it's tailored to what we do. So when the challenge is right for us, we're engaged by it and we find it fun. So why wouldn't that be true everywhere we face interesting challenge? Why couldn't schools construct challenges that make us interested? I mean, the other reason is that I don't think this is an alien experience for people. And when I say get back to this experience, I mean that literally. When you look at how toddlers play, like babies play, every game that babies play is a learning exercise. It's around like learning how learning motor skills or learning object permanence or, or learning basic logic things like counting. Like children simply don't play in functional ways that don't involve learning all the time. But what's what's amazing about it is they love it. They will do that on their own for long periods of time with no other motivation. So when we're babies and toddlers, we will learn as play. And when we get into schools, and I think this is the thing that, that pains me most of all and why I feel so patient, passionately about this, we, we spend our, our young lives having fun learning and w desiring to do very little else with our free time. And then we get into school and we grow to hate learning. And when I look at that as a game designer, I have a hard time believing that's necessary. There's the possibility that the abstraction of the material in the classroom is just going to be uh, going to require techniques that aren't fun. It's possible that individual preference will always lead students to push towards certain assignments and away from other assignments by just taste. But I don't see why we couldn't take the formula that games understand for how to use challenge to engage when challenge is appropriately balanced and make everything more fun for everybody. I see no reason why school has to be seen as a chore. Why couldn't school just be an entertainment exercise the whole time? If games are already teaching us, and we know we can design education using the principles of games, why can't we just make the whole school a game? You know, and let everyone just play the whole time. Because I have a feeling you'd have less people dropping out if they found school fun. And I have a feeling you'd have people more engaged. Now, this is... <laughs> now, this is already being performed in certain ways. And, you know, like there are schools where this is, this is being approached in a, in, a, in a limited way, from limited grades, for limited access. Um, you know, this is a shot from, from Quest to Learn, which is uh, the school that Katie State Leland established in New York and Chicago around how education um, can be influenced by games and by, by instruction with games. And I think that the, the, this is a kind of a good first step. And there's a lot of interesting exploration going on here. And I don't think we're just going to automatically get this right. I think that there's a lot of experimentation we need to continue to do. Um, but I think people are starting to approach this, this step. And what I want game designers to do is just imagine how radical this could be. Right? I just want you to have a vision in your head of where education can go. Because it's a place where we can bring it if we want. That we can take all this expertise we've learned around creating a billion dollars of industry that reaches every part of the world, a cultural event that everyone does from the, from the youngest years they're alive 
um, till as we increasingly get older with game designers until the day they die. You know, this activity where we can challenge ourselves and we can be improved by that challenge in a way that we simply enjoy. That it doesn't have to be taking medicine. That it could just be fun. And we could improve everybody's education through a way that everyone finds more valuable because it's tailored specifically to them. Using technologies that enable that in, in a way that doesn't explode costs in the way that we always imagined it would when we looked at this from the industrial lens. That's the dream. And games already do it for games. All we have to do is bring it to education. So my hope is that in 15 years, um, schools have been just radically reimagined uh, to a system that, that really just incorporates game design down to its core. Um, and it gives me hope to think that education is approaching a place where we're not only going to get more efficient at teaching people, we're going to get more fun. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you know what? I'm going to see if there's just one question. So one person with one question to ask Nick while we have him um, in the room, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, how did that go, by the way? <laughs> it, it went really well. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we kind of run this um, when I was at home, and we had um, all sorts of kind of uh, uh, weird sound difficulties, which we experienced again. But I'm glad we've overcome that. So um, there is one question in the room. So I'm just going to um, pass the mic over to uh, Anya. It needs to be this mic, so I'll come to you. Hang on a second. Mic's going across the room. Mic's being passed like a baton. Was oh, this Anya? I know Anya. <laughs> Oh, no. But hi. <laughs> um, hi there, Nick. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about how do you, how do you go about explaining all of that, which makes complete sense, I think, to most people in this room, um, but I think the education secretary in, in, in England, at least, would describe you as being well-meaning and wouldn't understand any of it. So how do you, how do you explain this to policymakers in the US? Have you, have, you had to, have you had that kind of debate with people who just don't get what you're saying? And how do you tackle that? Well, that's a great question, right? I mean, usually, you know, education in the U.S. is really at its wit's end. I mean, they, they've, I mean, literally billions of dollars have been spent, and in, 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 in large part, like, the clearest results we have is that we're pretty sure that a good teacher is better for a classroom, and if we can somehow define what a good teacher is. And, like, that's, that's about as much as we can say definitively. There's just a lot of contradictory research. So what I usually do is I just point at the success of games to teach. I don't point at the reach of games because that, that gets thrown away really fast. It's like, yeah, of course, kids like Pokemon. But I talk about how they've memorized Pokemon. And I, and I show examples of the memorization of Pokemon because it's kind of crazy. There's like 700 of those things. And kids actually know them really, really well. Or you can show the complexity of logic in League of Legends or the memorization of recipes and the use of applied logic in Minecraft to build circuits, right? There are all of these places where we can point to direct educational things. Like, in, in Minecraft, circuits are circuits. They literally work the way circuits do. So when kids play Minecraft and they build, like, elevators and stuff, they're actually working with physical computing. It's, it's, it's amazing how that works. And they learn it. Like, they actually know it and can repeat it back to other people and be creative with it. So we can actually point to examples of that happening. Um, and so that's usually the place where I start, is by not trying to argue that we can make these things fun at first. What I want to argue is efficacy. Like, we can actually teach people through these systems, and what's important is that they're self-motivated. Don't use the word fun around educators. <laughs> Just stay completely away from that word, because as soon as that word comes out of your mouth, they think silly and childish and they don't want to touch you. Talk about engaging. Talk about compelling. Talk about self-motivated. Talk about autodidactic. These are the words that educators generally want to hear. They want to hear that people are motivated. Even though that means fun, and we all know that means fun, we're going to just keep that under our, under our jacket for a little while, because like, like if everybody has fun with it, like they'll just figure that out themselves. We don't need the, the policymakers to understand that. The second thing that you want to do, though, is you want to show them what assessment can do, because that's really where they get, they get caught up. The, the issue that education typically has is they just can't keep track of what every student's doing. And when they see these technologies and they start to understand, and this is particularly around things like social games and mobile social games where we track everything every user does, I'm talking about these heavy metrics server-driven systems, um, you see educators' eyes light up because that's the prize they're looking for. Um, and and I, what I hope this argument showed is that as soon as you start introducing that idea of assessment, 
and assessment-based learning, you just fall down a slippery slope to games. You just can't introduce the idea of like individually tracked movement that adjusts to a user and not end up in fun. So my argument would be, meet them on their needs when you talk to educators about this stuff. Because you'll actually find that their needs are very close to yours if you just lose the, the trappings of games for a second. And you, you step back away from this sort of passionate desire to get Mario in the classroom, which I know we all have. Um, you, you just need to kind of approach it from, from the, from the point, standpoints of assessment and learning. And once you do that, then you start speaking a language that they've actually been speaking for years and years. They just don't realize that games speak that same language. And as they do, games become much more enticing to them. Cool. Um, again, we're just so, so, so lucky to have um, Nick join us. And um, uh, let's have a, a big, massive, massive cheer for Nick. I'm sorry I can't be there in person and play your games. <laughs> um, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and um, I'm sure we will speak to you soon. If you want to find out more, where can they go to find out more about your work and your company and come out and play? OK, so come out and play is just, oh, maybe I can do this really fast. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let me see if I can, I can do this really quickly. Um, Oh, you might have to share this. No, that won't work. Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do it anyway. All right, so, so for Come Out and Play, uh, you want to go to comeoutandplay.org. Um, that's, that's where we go for all that stuff. If you, can, if you can open a share drive on this machine, I'm actually typing the URLs okay. uh, up. Um, and then my stuff is Playmatics. Um, so either of those are, are good places to start. Come Out and Play is going to be running in San Francisco next weekend. So if you happen to be in San Francisco next weekend, you can, you can check it out. Otherwise, we run playtests in New York all the time. So if you're rolling through New York and you're interested in seeing what Come Out and Play is up to, uh, definitely check out our website, and we'll give you information about our playtests. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. I will speak to you very soon. OK. Take, take care. care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.